the Second Life Book Club. My name is Draxter Dupre. This is the last Second Life Book Club in the year 2021. And uh, we are here actually in the year 2145 at uh, the height of the history wars. Refugees are leaving this era to go back about 100 years, resulting in a refugee crisis in cities like Toronto. There are a lot of tent cities in Toronto. If the camera can zoom over a broadcast that's going on here at the desk um, of General Almo's office. Um, we're here at General Almo's little office and he has all these Chutskis lying around while he is actually lying in the cod. Uh, General Almo is the leader of the Teleosophic Corps Command. Uh, and um, let's see if the camera can, can zoom in here. He is, he's taking a nap over there while a myriad of timelines are competing with each other, okay? Nobody seems to care about these timelines. Nobody seems to care about what's gonna happen in, in 2255 when time ends. And a lot of farmers are confined in that timeline. Here with me on the Second Life Book Club in this little uh, office here in a future that uh, we hope will not come to pass is Canadian writer, Kate Hartfield, presumably the only person who's watching this, who knows what uh, what I'm talking about. Hello, Kate, <laughs> how are you? I'm doing well, thanks. I'm happy to be here. Well, I'm not sure I'm happy to be in this future, but you know, we'll see. It's so cool because um, in your book, uh, Ellis Payne, now I forgot if it's in Ellis Payne Rides, let me look it up, or if it's in Ellis Payne Arrives. Oh no, it's in Ellis Payne Rides. For my parents who taught me to work for a better timeline. This is the, the dedication of, of the Ellis Payne sequel. We're talking mm -hmm. about the Ellis Payne um, series. If you had 15, 20 seconds to give an elevator pitch, as they like to call it in, the, in Silicon Valley, uh, about what the, what the series is about, how would you... How would you describe it? So it's two novellas about a time traveling highway woman from the 18th century um, and a rogue time traveler from the 22nd century um, who is, uh, well, she's getting into trouble and there's a, a time war brewing and the two of them become unlikely allies. Aha, uh -huh. okay. And why is the story set? Now, this is my follow-up question once I'm interested in the uh, in the pitch. Why is it set in the 1800s in England? Uh, well, it started out, I had this idea for a mystery story. Um, I just, you know, sometimes these ideas come to you, but you, you, they need a little bit of time to develop. So the idea that I had was, you know, what if there was this highway woman in 18th century England? And there were quite a few um, secret highway women uh, in uh, the 18th and 17th and 16th centuries. Uh, some of them were, in fact, quite wealthy, and uh, and le they led these double lives. And I thought, well, what if a woman like that had to solve a mystery in order to preserve her secret? Mm -hmm. So that's what happens to Alice, is uh, she needs to solve the mystery of what happened to this missing carriage. Otherwise, all the uh, attention is going to come on her, and then her secret will be blown. Uh, so, But then what, what happened to the missing carriage is uh, time travel. Uh, so she discovers that way that there's uh, time travel afoot. And again, a highway woman is basically a female version of a highway man who is, or yep. these people hold up carriages for uh, probably money, maybe, or maybe they kidnap someone, a rich person back in the day. Yeah. Did they do that too? Or it was mostly cash? Yeah, mostly just holding people up for money. Um you know, there were not actual police forces uh, in England at that time. Uh, it was just, they were just starting to begin uh, in the 18th century. So it was what? mostly the highways were, were very lawless places and you were basically taking, taking your life and your money in your own hands when you went out and uh, people would lie in wait in uh, desolate areas and be ready to relieve you of whatever you had uh, in your carriage. So it was almost a cost of doing business in some areas, almost a kind of toll. Now, uh, your book is is um, I'm not, I'm not going to say you're under underselling your your Alice Payne story, uh, Kate, because I know how difficult it is to to talk about one one's own work in sort of 
in you know not necessarily glowing terms but but just sort of pre, uh, you know present it uh make it palatable i find that very difficult about my own work so let me just say these books are just absolutely fantastic and they there's so much in them there is an exploration of uh, these female characters that are in love with each other in in a time that is obviously uh, where that was not uh, quote unquote normal. There are also some bumbling uh, white men maybe on the side. Maybe I read too much into it, but I found that really cool. Every character, the way you set it up, it's it, it's very complex with the time travel. And I want to ask you later, uh, how do you keep track of all these different um, time? Uh, strains and the and the timeline and the draft the timeline and the reality there is there's real history in these books so tr really really enjoyable and you set up a a world i think you can write if you want to which i will also ask you maybe the audience w wants to ask you that too if you want to write this stuff until the end of your life you could probably do it because there's so many so many characters to explore in there it's unbelievable yeah now, thank you uh, very much. Pe people watching here, they're going like, you know, what, what what's happening with the audience? Is there no audience? So, Kate, uh, we're obviously here in 2145. Let's go where the audience is. The audience is in the 1788 region. Uh, so follow me. I'm I'm gonna walk very slowly. Here's the here's the rotating globe to keep track of the um what's happening in the globe. There are no time zones on here on this globe. General Almo, look at this General Almo character. He's quite handsome, though. I guess he is. Yeah, he's yeah. Uh, he's sort of a mentor figure, and um, yeah, but he's, he's not he's all evil. Character. Like he's not super yeah. evil because he, I mean, he wants to win the history war, um, and uh, Prudence wants to end everything. She wants to destroy all time travel. So I guess he still has um, a lot of different facets where he's not just a one-dimensional evil dude. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of feel for him, even though he does turn out to be pretty evil. But his his motivations are understandable, at least. And I think everyone in the book is like that. Nobody's perfect, but their their motivations are um, a little bit complex. And, and once you start to understand their backstory, you can see where they're coming from. Now, I seem to be stuck here again. Let me see here. You are not a very good prosecutor. So I'm going to go through to 1788. Let's see, where is Kate? Is Kate here with me? Let I am me... just by the horses. I'm trying to walk. Oh, through oh the you're already there. Just... Hold yeah, on. Yeah, sorry, I went ahead. Oh my God, she just went through the portal without me. That's actually what happens in the book several times. <laughs> <laughs> I got eager. I guess there we go. I'll follow you now. Yeah, here's the here's the horses. We could take them out for a ride later. Um, yeah. Let's walk. Let's walk up the stairs here, and let's give the the, the camera a little um, opportunity here to maybe zoom out and show us the the surroundings of this magnificent steampunk laboratory that we got for this show. Is your novel a steampunk novel? I didn't think of it as steampunk when I wrote it because it's a little early for steampunk. It's 18th century rather than 19th. And uh, right. so there's no steam really, um, at least not to the same degree. And it doesn't deal with um, the sort of British empire or colonialism themes as much as I would think that steampunk would do. There's none of the aesthetics like airships and that kind of thing. However, it is about, uh, you know, technology in, in the past and it is uh, set in England and there's uh, a lot of, you know, some steampunk elements there. So I'd say it is if you like steampunk and if you don't like steampunk, it's absolutely not. <laughs> ah, see, that's a good, that's good marketing right there. Okay, let's walk <laughs> through this door and then we will arrive um, here in a laboratory, there is a character in your book, Jane, and Jane came to mind when, when I talked with Ruby about designing this because Jane is the love interest of Alice and Jane is a little bit of an inventor. Um, and she, when they get their hands on the time, on the time machine thingies, uh, Jane is tinkering with them and she loves it and uh, she's tinkering with all sorts of stuff. So we decorated this place here according to uh, thinking about Jane and and sort of the laboratory. This is interesting with all this genre stuff, steampunk and and uh, did your publisher have a, have a difficulty of, of placing this? Because when we have guests here, we always talk about the difficulty to market 
um, which, you know, I mean, it's not an issue for an author. An author wants to be free to imagine worlds without sort of narrow classifications, but marketers, um, they get headaches when they have sort of genre defying stuff a little bit. Yeah, it is. It is a, a little bit of a mashup of different genres. And um, uh, I think Tor.com is pretty used to that. Oh, I missed the stairs. Here we go. I know I'm not the first one to miss the stairs. Take your time. You can actually, you can teleport to the chair if you want to. Um, All right, that's what I'll do. Welcome everybody. Sorry that we we had, uh, there you go. And now click the chair again and, and choose a sit. If you click the chair, then you'll be set it properly. And let me also okay. apologize to the audience because we were caught uh, in a different time zone. We were caught in 2,100 and, uh, 45. So I hope uh, people people accept my apologies. Kate, if you click the click the chair again, and you'll get a little window in the upper right hand corner and that that will seat you correctly. I seem to be here. Let me stand up again and try if I can do this better here. Yeah, there you go. Sometimes you get like sucked up by the chair, which is weird. Now we're talking about Alice Payne arrives. Alice Payne rides. It's an ensemble cast. I found it really interesting that you went with this ensemble cast and you still named it Alice Payne. I mean, she is the important character, but I was just wondering if you toyed with the idea of, of naming it differently because Prudence is very important. She's an agent from the future. Jane is important. She's the lover, Alice's lover, the inventor. Then uh, mm -hmm. this guy, Captain Ray Auden, also kind of plays a role. That's who I refer to as sort of like a overeager um, uh, male person. That yeah, is... I can see him in the audience. That's great. He's actually <laughs> right here in the audience. That's right. Yeah. Camera, zoom to Captain Ray Auden, please. <laughs> I just insulted him straight on the book club. <laughs> Yeah, they, they really are ensemble books. And, and I played around with different titles, um, but I could just never really get one that uh, I liked as much as that. Um, and Ellis is, uh, she's sort of the catalyst in every story. I think uh, she sort of is brings the whole group together. So uh, that's why she's the title character, but really it is an ensemble. Now, um, Prudence wants to destroy the, the ability to travel in time. Her boss does not want to. There's the farmers, the farmers versus the um, misguided. And mm -hmm. this is funny because uh, the misguided are, they they don't uh, call themselves <laughs> misguided. They call themselves actually <laughs> guided. So what do they want? What's the conflict between the farmers and the misguided? The basic idea is that the farmers are taking an organic approach to history or so they tell themselves so they think that it's not a good idea to use time travel to make things better that it'll just cause more problems and the guides as they call themselves are as the name implies they're trying to guide history to make it a little bit better to make sure that the outcomes um, improve uh, because the kind of time travel that i've used uh, actually, you actually can change history and uh, you can just keep changing it over and over again. And uh, you won't even remember that you've done so because you've changed your own history as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it can get quite complicated and it's very dangerous, obviously, to time travel for this reason. So those are their two founding ideologies is, uh, you know, a more organic method, which is the farmers. And that's why they call themselves farmers and uh, a more hands on approach. And they sort of loosely map to old style conservative in the sense of uh, like an Edmund Burke conservative where you don't want to do too much and a more progressive mm -hmm. approach. But as time goes on, they, they basically stop focusing on their ideology and they just they just want to get each other. So it's just this constant war between these two groups of who can make history look the way they want it to look. And what is so funny, actually, and I wanted to put this on a slide um, and now I'm going to use the F-bomb, which usually uh, the guest does. Uh, Matt Ruff <laughs> used the F bomb on this program 10 times in a row. Uh, but uh, in your book, uh, there's a discussion to um, to fix history. Um, Prudence's job is to prevent World War One, pretty much, or or just soften mm -hmm. it. Now, um, 
and and then there's a discussion about another time where she might be more effective than in the time that she was assigned to, which is 1880s. And people talk about 2016. And then one character now forgot it was with Prudence says, oh, it's forget about fucking 2016. 2016 <laughs> yeah. is completely fucked. We, yeah, we that's you know, yeah. whatever they, you know, they could go there and they, again, like what, as you were saying, they manipulate certain aspects uh, of, of, of what, what's happening in that timeline in order to affect the, the change. But everybody is in, has a consensus that whatever you do in 2016, it's too late. Forget about it. So that's mm -hmm. hilarious. Yeah, and it it I, you know I, I like that line too. It's one of my favorite lines in the book because it's so it's so prudence and uh, and also I think it resonates with us obviously, um, but in a more serious way. That's definitely what I wanted to get at with these books because I was writing it in 2016, and uh, I had this question, you know, how did we get here? I think many people felt for various reasons uh, around the middle of the last decade that. The timeline had slipped somehow that we'd gone off track and that you know and and this is a question of how did we get here how did history conspire to get us to this place uh so that's where the the thematic idea came from for the books now um i put up a slide here in the back this is a quote uh, an excerpt from alice Payne arrives uh this is prudence's thought about this uh about the time um travel ability it is pointless to keep trying to push history one way while the misguided are trying to push it in another. But he doesn't have to, he, and she refers to General Almo, Almo, but he doesn't have the courage to do what needs to be done. The only way to end this war, to end all wars, is to stop anyone from changing history ever again. So this is her plan and her gaggle of, of uh, revolutionaries to basically destroy the ability to travel in time uh, by by uh, killing the uh, by 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 destroying the 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 the, the machines mm -hmm. um and and here's another quote and then we'll go to a reading right away this is uh this is general almo this is also an interesting quote or excerpt from the book um where general almo again not necessarily the bad guy but the, but the big guy um who is running things he says the individual has no inherent existence a human life is ephemeral a conjunction of cause and consequence, uh, consequence. Each of us is just information and one piece of information is not any more valuable than any other. If time travel has taught me anything, it's that individuals don't matter. So Kate, this is interesting. So this is the, the guy who looks at, I mean, he's, he's, a, he's a general, right? I mean, this is how generals, I guess, have to think about global conflict. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And that's why I think he's interesting to me is that a lot of his philosophy does make sense to me on some level, but he's taking it, he's taking it to a very nihilist extreme and has stopped seeing human life as valuable because when you're massaging history all the time and people are disappearing and reappearing in history, uh, he gets this sense of, uh, you know, that none of it really matters. Um, and and uh, I can see how that would be very compelling for someone like that and also very dangerous. And that's why he, uh, Prudence eventually realizes that her mentor figure, her general, uh, has just completely gone off the rails and she decides she needs to do something really drastic about it. But he was very, there's even, I think there's a reference somewhere in there to a G.K. Chesterton story, one of the Father Brown mysteries, uh, I think it's called mm -hmm. The Hammer of God or something like that. And it's about the danger of looking down from a high place and how everyone else starts to look like ants. And so that's, uh, that's sort of the general Elmo philosophy is that he thinks he's better than everyone else. I mean, this his 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 philosophy is also not compatible to uh, if if you call yourself a pacifist. I mean, I don't know if Prudence, or the, one of the main characters, would call herself a pacifist. Um, Alice is is also comes up through the military through her father. She she does has a Robin Hood attitude in a way, a robbing mm -hmm. um, richer people. Also, basically, she starts robbing people who abuse women frankly that's mm -hmm. got, i think the initial impetus which i found very cool that's that's what makes her a highway woman um how do you keep track uh before we go to the reading how do you keep track of all these different um strands of time do you, do you have a chart do you have like i don't know like is, is there like a visual aid that you use uh there probably should have been i mostly just had a lot of notes uh so in i think it's both books or maybe it's only in alice Payne rides but there's uh, at the back 
uh, there's a little guide that says the, the current draft of history and it tells you the dates ah. when everything happened. And that actually started out as my own notes because I would keep various versions of, okay, here's one draft of history has these dates in it. Another draft of history has these things happening. Uh, so I just had a whole bunch of different note files. Um, I do use uh, Eon Timeline, A-E-O-N Timeline, which is a, a piece of software. Um, and it's lots of fun, uh, but I didn't use it that much for this book because uh, I just found that it was so complicated that actually just writing out each version of history was the easiest way. It was so complicated that I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just totally give up keeping track of it in the first <laughs> place. And let's just see if the reader, under, uh, you know, if the reader <laughs> yeah. uh, finds any uh, inconsistencies. But it is really remarkable because, I mean, you know, time travel, I don't have to tell you. It's, it's, I, I love time travel. I mean, if time travel, it's probably, it is a, a genre, I guess. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's seen as... It, 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 those any any time give me any time travel story any day and and your stuff is so good and we had joe haldeman here uh famous sci-fi writer the forever war and he wrote a book called the accidental time machine so if you're into a time machine binge get the ellis Payne books and then get the accidental time machine and i believe that joe haldeman said something similar about like keeping track of stuff um kate we're gonna do a reading i have to ask you to stand up and okay. magically out of the don't don't be afraid you're not going to fall off the stage uh, but magically from under the stage will a book stand will appear now uh, with Alice Payne arrives let's hope this book stand arrives soon in the meantime if I could guide the camera over to the side here there's a huge golden frame a huge golden frame with uh, the most recent draft of history, as Kate just referred to as. So let's see if the camera can can put that uh, on there. And the, uh, the most recent draft of history starts in 1756, when Alice Payne is born in Kingston, Jamaica. So she's also dark-skinned, which um, causes a little bit well, it's she's seen with with a little bit suspicion, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she lives in England, and she's uh, her father is uh, is a white Englishman, um, and so yeah, she uh, she has a lot of social tension in her life uh, because of that, and she's based on um, some s several real women of the time as well, whose uh, life oh. stories were really fascinating. Oh wow. I was going to ask. I'll ask you after the after the reading because the real history is is amazing. So anyway, people here in the room, they can look through the most recent draft of history and they get a little sense of uh, what's happening here in these books. And the t the history war begins uh, uh, twenty ninety two, so we still have a little bit of time. <laughs> um, <laughs> but before, of course, the Berlin Convention on Organ Manufacture. Now that's interesting, and and teleosophy begins even earlier. So now to get a little bit of um, feeling for the texture of the actual story kate is going to read i believe from the opening yes am i close enough to the podium oh yeah here? The, the the book stand will yeah you're you're, you're perfect the book stand okay. will um arrange itself according nice. to you yeah yeah perfect. it's it's a uh artificially right. intelligent book stand what, what do we need to know for the for the setup so i'm going to read the very first chapter from alice Payne arrives which is the first book uh, so this is uh, a chapter that sets up Alice and her uh, her work on the highway and who she is. And so she she calls herself the Holy Ghost. Uh, that's her her sort of stage name uh, as a highway woman. Um, and uh, she's about to rob a carriage. And uh, little does she know that this carriage uh, will disappear shortly after she robs it, which will uh, lead to the whole events of the book. But this is just her getting ready to to make that robbery happen. <clears throat> let, let, let me ask you one more thing before you start reading. There's also yeah. a little automaton that um, Jane built. I don't know. This is, this is not in this excerpt, but what function does the automaton have? It's also kind of to like make her victims more afraid that she is she has yeah. backup or that she's like super knowledgeable in technology or, or whatnot. Yeah, yeah. So Alice lives with her father and she also lives with a woman named Jane Hodgson. And Jane is her companion and secretly her lover. And Jane is an inventor. She builds all sorts of, of tools and machines and things. 
And uh, so she's built this automaton. Uh, and the 18th century was, in fact, a, a great age of automatons. There were, there were tons of them all over the place. Uh, so this automaton, uh, it, in the darkness on the side of the road, um, looks quite creepy when it just pops up out of nowhere. And so this is um, a tool that Alice uses to frighten the people in the carriages. Uh, she doesn't have a partner on the road. She just does it on her own. But uh, this automaton that Jane built is her kind of silent partner that she uses to scare people. Awesome. And here we go. Kate right. Hartfield reading from Alice Payne Arrives. Chapter one, concerning a robbery and what comes after. 1788. The highwayman known as the Holy Ghost lurks behind the ruined church wall. Lurking has a different quality to waiting, she reflects, having time for reflection. Waiting is what she did for the first five years after father returned from the war in America, much changed. That's how everyone put it that first year. How is Colonel Payne? Oh, people say he is much changed. Now people use the same tone to say the opposite. How is Colonel Payne? Oh, he's much the same. No change, his poor daughter. Alice grew tired of waiting for change. Colonel Payne's poor daughter does not fade into the background. She hides in it. She's quivering in the saddle, rider, hat, and gun, all cocked after a fashion. Ah, there it is. A carriage comes rattling around the corner, the horse's gait slowing as the slope rises toward Gibbet Hill. Alice lurks halfway up. Behind her on the summit, there are no trees but those of the Tyburn sort, swinging with cages and corpses as a warning to highwaymen. It seems to have worked. She has this section of Dray Road, fenced in with trees and ruins, all to herself. The road here is a hollow way, a track worn into the ground over the centuries, its banks curving up like the bottom half of a tunnel on either side, a trap for her victims. What a gaudy contraption the Earl of Lutterworth uses to get around the country in, half painted in gold as if he were Marie Antoinette, its four lamps lit, although the sun is still bloodying the forest. Four horses, plumed. That dark bulk on the seat is the coachman and footman, both liveried like dancing monkeys, no doubt. Inside, it's big enough for four, but there will only be two. The odious Earl will be traveling with his manservant. That makes four men, two of them armed with swords, and probably pistols, too. Loaded, maybe, but not cocked. Her left calf nuzzles her horse's belly. Havoc's withers twitch and he steps quietly to the right, making no sound until she taps fast with both legs and they are out in the open. By the time Havoc stops in the middle of the road where he has stopped so many times before, she has both pistols in her hands. Stand and deliver, she growls. The first time she did this, she felt exposed, despite the hat low over her forehead, the black mask and green kerchief, the long gray cloak, the breeches and boots and gloves. She and Jane had meant it half as a lark. Jane was not convinced Alice would go through with it until she had. It was revenge, the first time, against a teacher of the pianoforte who preyed on any girl who was not sufficiently warned by her friends. Revenge and a little much needed money. Now it is a regular affair, this robbery on the road. There are plenty of villains making their way through Hampshire, ready to be relieved of a purse, a blow struck in secret for womankind. Despite the fact that all the victims are men of suspect character when it comes to women, no one has made that connection or suspected that the Holy Ghost is a woman, much less that it is Alice. All her skin is covered, lest the color of it call to any local's mind Colonel Payne's poor daughter. Today, after a dozen robberies, she does not feel exposed. She doesn't feel like Alice Payne sitting on a horse in the middle of the road in a disguise. She is the Holy Ghost, and she's about her vengeful business. And I'll stop there. That's Kate Hartfield reading from Alice Payne Arrives. That is so wonderful. Thank you, Kate. This is this is really setting up the the texture, getting a feel for the textures. Uh, just uh, just awesome. Here on on YouTube chat, Theron says this is awesome, and uh, Isolta waves uh, kitten. Oh, Kitten has been a member for two months. Thank you. Uh, Kate, really, really wonderful. Now, th there is a lot of real history in there. You just also mentioned uh, automatons. I was not um, aware of, of this also being being an age of, of, of this type of development. Now, you must uh, obviously do a lot of research. Uh, 
for these books, there is in this particular book, I was sitting there also with uh, Wikipedia, as I do with with many of the past <laughs> um, authors. For some reason, they all they all weave it in really well. Um, Arthur, the Duke of Brittany, actually disappeared from 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 a dungeon uh, mm-hmm. or from from a prison in two in twelve twelve o three. Of course, in your book, um, he basically was abducted. Yep. By those folks with the time machine, and um, Rudolf, the crown prince of Austria who was in a uh, he was the heir of the throne at the time 18 uh, uh, 1888 or 89 he commits suicide with his with his mistress and mm-hmm. and they are trying to prevent that so um i'm just going to throw a few slides up here a little bit of uh, text to the chateau de falaise is where um arthur the duke of brittany was was incarcerated by by his 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 brother john and then our time travelers come in there and they, they take him out and they take smallpox with him. Um, so tell me a little bit about this, this research um, methodology of yours. Are you looking into, are there periods that you like better than others? Or do you look like, hey, where is some mystery that I can sort of just put time travel or, or blame time travel for? Yeah, yeah, it's... Uh it's fun working with real history. And I often do with these books in particular, I was looking for the sort of unexplained uh, things. They're the things that are so weird that you almost think they must have a a speculative explanation because how could, how could that possibly have happened? Um, So yeah, mysteries uh, really appeal to me. The, uh, the story of Arthur of Brittany is, is sort of like the princes in the tower, but a little bit less well known is that he was an heir to the throne of England, who uh, was done away with by uh, King John, um, his uncle, uh, and uh, Wait, I have this you know, nobody from really... Wikipedia. I have this this uh, yeah. this drawing. Or what is this here? This this was from Wikipedia. At the in the Middle Ages, they had these these drawings. I don't know where they appeared. This is author from Duke of Brittany, eleven eighty seven to about twelve o three. Yeah, mm-hmm. but, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So I just, it's one of those things where it seems like what we don't know about history leaves a little bit of space for the fiction writer to fill it in and say, well, it might have been this, you know, this might have happened. And uh, I was really fascinated by uh, poor Rudolf, uh, whose death really did change the succession uh, of the uh, sort of the vestiges of what had been the Holy Roman Empire. And it's really the reason why Franz Ferdinand uh, became the heir. And of course, as we all know, Franz Ferdinand's death was the moment that launched the First World War. Mm -hmm. Uh, So uh, what Prudence is trying to do is is trying to prevent the First World War. uh, And of course, all of the many, many causes that led up to that. And but then what do you do if if you change one aspect of that history? uh, Exactly. Yeah, this is this is the brilliant part. Sorry to step in. here. I I threw up a slide of of um, of Rudolf who who killed himself again and and uh Franz Ferdinand came on the throne and he was then assassinated uh by a a, a, um, a Serbian um activist at the time and and that launch was a catalyst for World War One as you said in 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 the book they actually and th- this is the whole discussion I mean it's like the same discussion how do you you know if you if you kill Hitler's mother I guess uh what would happen but then you set off all these other uh, events and that's again mm-hmm. the the the, the the uh, the sentiment that that prudence and her people put forward you know there's no good there's just no no way to kind of uh use time travel in a way that is 100 percent safe basically yeah yeah and and i wanted to raise the question of what we do now you know to look back and say okay well what would you do to change history we do and it's, it's sort of easy for us to say well we would you know we'd, we'd kill hitler's mother or you know whatever we would do um, but I think the the lesson of the book, if 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 you can say that, is that um, you know uh, good actions do have consequences. All actions have consequences, and we kind of have to own it and not just look backwards with hindsight and say, uh, well, we would have done it this way, we would have done it that way. You know, everything we do from every moment is changing history. We are changing the history of the future right now. Um, so I think sort of taking ownership of what we're doing and um, and all the little actions that we do as individuals. Uh, turns out to have um, a bigger effect than any one 
action that we could go back and fix everything magically because we can't just fix everything magically. We have to work together. Um, and I think there are a lot of time travel books that we're exploring the same idea around the same time. Um, another recent one that came out is Annalene Newitz's um, The History of Another Timeline, which uh, has a lot of the same themes and comes at it from kind of a different angle. Um, mm. Yeah. I have to, I have to, um, I'm in contact with her. Uh, there was some scheduling issues, but uh, I'll do, uh, I'll reach out and, and offer her some different dates. It would be great to have her. Uh, Pantera says, thinking about the butterfly effect. Um, and uh, Ava Bloodrow says here in the local chat, can we add Boris Johnson's mother to the list? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, there might be Boris Johnson's fans who would uh, object. I don't know if, they, if he still has any left. <laughs> I'm not sure. But but yeah. yeah, as you described this, Kate, also you have, I mean, you, you, you refer in the book uh, a few times to different drafts of history, which I really like. I haven't heard that before in other time travel novels. There, the, the draft. So that, that suggests the malleability and just all these different factors. So it, it, it gives us, um, it gives us agency. I mean, do, mm -hmm. do you actually see, I mean, this is a deeply philosophical question. Do you, do you feel we have agency? I do. Yeah. Um, but I think it is sometimes a little bit different than, than we think. Um, I think it is every small thing that we do matters in some way. Uh, and I think, you know, talking about the drafts of history, I meant it in, in a number of different ways. There's partly because these are actual time travelers literally changing history. Um, but also just as a reminder that history is always constructed, that um, history is not a one-to-one -one map of the past. It's a story that we tell ourselves about what happened. Um, so uh, that aspect of it too led to me using the word draft to kind of uh, bring that reminder into it. Mm -hmm. Now you are a big fan. I I uh, learned uh, in our research, and uh, Shyla the Super Gecko here in the first row is our chief uh, researcher. You're a big fan of Je uh, Jeffrey Chaucer, and I, did I butcher his name? No, no, that's right. Yeah, English is yeah. not my first language. Now Jeffrey Chaucer, English poet, uh, best known for the Canterbury Tales. And as a matter of fact, so what, what, what is important about Jeffrey Chaucer for you? Why, why, why are you, uh, why is he an important uh, role model for you if, if he is? Yeah, yeah. So I have, um, I wrote two pieces of interactive fiction for choice of games. Uh, and one of them is called The Road to Canterbury. And uh, it allows you to um, play a character who is on pilgrimage with Jeffrey Chaucer. Uh, uh, at the time, just about when he was about to write the Canterbury Tales. Uh, so uh, I had a lot of fun writing that. You can play, you know, you can play a nun or you can play, a, um, you know, various diff different characters and you can have different uh, love affairs with the characters and, and it's tons of fun. So that's with choice of games. Uh, and then no, wait, rather... we have to contextualize this. So the Road to yeah. Canterbury is, is also, I put up a slide here, is a Nebula Award finalist. And and it is a, as they call, I wrote this down to get this right. Um, where are my sheets here? It is a interactive choose your own adventure. No, it's a text-based multiple choice interactive fiction game. Yep. That's what it says on the on the choice game websites. Website. Yeah. 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 So the Can way you that describe it works that for the total no yeah, please ex yeah. explain. I'm, I'm yeah, old. so you basically you uh, it's all text based. There's no pictures or anything like that. And what you do is you'll read about two or three paragraphs of text and then you'll get a choice and you'll say, you know, do you want to go to the left or the right? Uh, it's always more complicated than that, but you'll have some sort of choice about uh, what the character does next. And then that will lead you to the next piece of text. And then every two or three paragraphs, you make a choice. Um, but rather than being in a book, it's on an app. So you'll play it on your phone or on the computer um, and you can play it on your browser, too. Uh, so it's it's basically like writing a, a piece of linear text, but you write uh, many, many different versions of it. So the amount of text is much bigger than any single playthrough will give you. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, based on the Choose Your Own Adventure books uh, conceptually. Um, I love those books. Here's a little collage of, of books uh, that, that, that Shyla put together, the Choose Your Own Adventure books, 
where you turn the page and you go to page 50 or you go to page 22. If you go left or right, if you feel this dude uh, is you, you want to kill him or you don't want to kill him. And in the digital context, this goes back here. We have comments here already. Ava says old school RPG. This goes back also to the um, uh, to the to the mods, multi-user dungeons. And this is this is really cool, Kate, that this is seemingly uh, this genre is 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 alive and well, where where people use their imagination to conjure up these visuals. Here's a little slide with the choice of games, which is the pu publisher of of your games. They have all sorts of different games. Choice of broadsides is one. Uh, Parliament of Knives, I Cyborg, and and you have Road to Canterbury, and you also have the Magician's Workshop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Magician's Workshop is set in Florence in 1512. So it's right around the time that the Medici family came back to uh, came back to Florence. So we have characters like Machiavelli and, and Leonardo. Uh, so it's basically, what if you were in Leonardo's workshop and you also had magic? Is writing these games, it sounds to me it's more work than writing a novel because you have to write four or five different times, I guess these different strands or where people go mm -hmm. yeah yeah it, it is it's a lot of work um you know for about thirty thousand words of playthrough uh you'll have to write about maybe 180 or 190 thousand words uh total um so uh and there are much bigger choice of games projects than that i know people who have written uh several hundred thousand words um so, uh, and I see a question, do, do you like referring to them as books or games? Uh, mm -hmm. I tend to refer to them as games, uh, but I'm easy either way. Um, they have been classified as games for things like the Nebula, and they're also in, in other game writing awards. And because it is interactive, I think uh, that's the category it usually gets put into. Uh, and they are, there are different ways to organize interactive fiction. The choice of games model basically uh, it's they describe it as an arm and fingers. Uh, so uh, the fingers come at the end. So the real branching where you just go completely off into new storylines really only happens at the end. Uh, and the all the choices along the way, they may take you to different scenes, but for the most part, they're they're affecting your character. You're building your character and your character's relationships. And then in the final chapters, that will that'll determine which scenes appear in those final chapters. Um, so that way you keep it from having to be even bigger than it would otherwise be. This is really interesting because I was just uh, realizing that Linden Lab actually had acquired a company called, well, they called the product Versu. Um, and I'm looking this up right now. This was in 2014. Um, a company and, and, and the technology developed by Emily Short and a few others, which was sort of a the way it was presented was that this was an interactive text-based game, but with a lot of artificial intelligence built into it, where the character actually, where the the algorithm changes um, who you are based on the interactions that you have with these fictional characters. So I I don't know, um, I can't evaluate if, if it was clever marketing or if that technology was, was already there, but Emily Short, if you look her up, I don't have any maybe somebody could put um, a link into the chat and look up Emily Short, but she is probably the most well-known uh, proponent of this um, algorithmically driven interactive fiction. But Kate, that in, in, in your stories, the, the, there is no, it's not, there's no algorithm driving this. No, it's it's all the entire the the agency is all with the with the player. So mm -hmm. you make all the choices and decide uh, where you're going to go and what kind of character you're going to be and the kind of relationships that you have. Um, and uh, it has uh, stats. Oh, thanks for uh, thanks very much, Ember, for that link. Yeah, I love Emily Short's blog. So ah, you're you're affecting yeah. your character's stats along the way. Um, so if you're mean to somebody in the first uh, chapter then that will skew your character's stats towards the the mean side of things for example um so uh oh i see it accumulates those stats oh i yeah. see yeah okay. yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wow that is really that is really super interesting you might actually get me um playing games although i hate games i'm a reader <laughs> <laughs> but these are reading games <laughs> yeah exactly it's it's sort of halfway between a book and a game yeah 
fantastic. I put another link in here. I just realized when I I interviewed uh, Emily Short for the for my uh, for my podcast. Now, um, one quick question about journalism and, and fiction, which I find interesting. I come from radio as a radio journalist. Um, and then I was uh, confined to the to the station. I was a little bit out there as a reporter, then as a news director inside. The relationship of journalism and um, and fiction that that I find always uh, fascinating. So so tell us a little bit. You you have a background in, in journalism. Was that uh, print journalism or? Yeah yeah. I I have a master's degree in journalism um, and uh, graduated in two thousand and one. And then I freelanced for a few years and then. For 11 years, I worked at a daily newspaper, and I was mostly in the opinion side of things. Uh, so I wrote a column and uh, editorials, and I eventually was the opinion editor uh, when I left in 20, the end of 2015. So uh, yeah, so I have a long background in journalism, and I still teach arts and culture journalism at a university here. Um, and it definitely uh, informs the way that I write books. I think the fact that um, I love research, you know, I love uh, finding out things and incorporating it into my fiction. And I think a lot of the same uh, themes uh, I'm dealing with in my fiction as well, you know, po sort of political themes and uh, questions of, you know, how do we make a better world and a better society and, um, you know, not to be too earnest, but I think all of that plays into it as well. Uh, do you... I often tell people, you know, as a news guy, I, I'm 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 looking at the news uh, every day. I, I I feel I have to. I come from from that world. Uh, I can uh, digest, uh, dissect. I know how uh, how the news is is made. I know how the sausage is made, and <laughs> so I can sort of step back and contextualize it. A lot of people during the pandemic, um, you know, and and before, uh, have adopted uh, doom scrolling, and they're just in this perpetual mode of of headlines, and I always tell them, you know, read a good book. Uh, I'm not advocating, you know, closing yourself off of what's happening in the so-called real world, but I, I always try to convince people that context really matters, and sometimes a a book that deals with the human condition in in a fictional form, um, a novel or a short story can really open your eyes and contextualize the, the real world. Um, and sometimes I get a pushback or the response is, well, uh, I don't want to close my eyes. Uh, you know, shit is going down and, and I need to be up, uh, up uh, on the news and stuff like that. But what people refer to as being up on the news is to be in this constant loop of basically the corporate media that sort of regurgitates stuff and gives you a very skewed perspective. How would you recommend we as news consumers? Um, I mean, what's your news diet? Let me just ask you that. I mean, what's a healthy, what's a healthy diet? What's a healthy balance? Yeah, uh, that is a really difficult question. Um, I think uh, now that I've been out of it for five years, uh, I definitely understand when people get frustrated with the the big newspapers um and i think opinion sections in particular i could go on about for uh, hours of all the problems that exactly we see because and, that's the other thing that people yeah. really still and i find this incredibly frustrating sorry to step in here mm -hmm. but they but people conflate opinion with, with news and then they sometimes conflate documentary with sort of daily news bits or human interest reportage or 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 you know, I mean, it's uh, there. There seems to be a frustrating lack of media literacy in the general public. In uh, anyways, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, definitely, and it's frustrating. I think, but at the same time, I don't think, I don't think that the answer is to necessarily unsubscribe. Uh, you know, I think when you see a newspaper that is doing uh, local work, in particular, you know, local journalism. Yes. Um, is so important. Uh, so I think, you know, we do need to support that any way we can. The whole model is is definitely broken and, and needs um, some kind of new approach. Um, but I don't know if that's a problem you and I can solve here in, in the next few minutes, but, you know, it's but a then big How do we sure. deal with the diet? But I mean, you answered mm -hmm. the question in a sense, like yeah. I would say, you know, if you if you have questions about, you know, your own mental health and how, yeah. how should you balance this out, um, cut down on a uh, doom scrolling however you do yeah. it I'm, i it's difficult yeah. cut down on uh 
watching updates on cable news that give you absolutely no new information, read a book, yeah. uh, watch a long form documentary and also support your local news source, uh, Kate, right? I mean, this is th there's a big yeah. difference between a local news source and and sort of a um, a nationwide uh, cable channel. Yeah, for sure. You know, when you find a reporter who you think is doing good work, uh, who seems to be uh, actually investigating things and finding things out, um, you know, support that person. Um, and I do think, like you say, contextualizing by reading uh, longer work, uh, some magazine work or some uh, nonfiction books. Uh, and I agree that I think fiction is a is a really important addition that you know to the diet, so to speak, because this is how we understand the world is through stories and uh, the stories that we tell ourselves. Um, so I do think that the two go together. Um, what was I going to say? Oh yeah. Local news, speaking about local news, the, the, the Miami Herald and the name escapes me now, the, the woman, this is a re just a recent example. She actually broke, not broke, but she followed up. She followed the Jeffrey Epstein story in detail and she was supported by the, by uh, the Miami Herald. And if it, hadn't been for this woman's um this particular reporter's tenacity the jeffrey epstein uh story about abusing uh young girls at a uh industrial scale together with uh just lane maxwell uh, would 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 have been you know would have been under the rug so that's that's a good example of a recent um thing a local yeah. news um thing here's a quote that we put up on the board behind us uh, from you, you say, I find that a lot of my concerns when I'm writing fiction are pretty much identical to the concerns that I had every day when I was writing editorials for the newspaper. Questions of how really bad events happen through goodwill. How do societies end up in frightening situations? How do democracies die? And how do democracies get born? Mm -hmm. Of course, the difference is uh, you didn't have a time machine when you worked at the newspaper. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's true. I, I think those are, you know, they definitely occupied me when I was writing the Alice Payne books in a really obvious way. You know, they're literally about how do we how do we make a better world and how do we change the timeline. Um, but uh, the question of, you know, how are democracies born? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my next book, uh, the embroidered book is uh, set mm -hmm. during the French Revolution. And so there's a lot of that concern as well about, um, you know, here you have a time in history when many, many people could see the problems around them and were trying to fix it. And, uh, you know, we ended up with the terror and, um, you know, it just uh, the promise of the Enlightenment really withered and died in a lot of ways. And I think the, the seeds of that were were rotten to begin with. There was a lot in the Enlightenment that was very colonial, very imperialistic, yes. very racist, you know. Um, so going back and examining that's that why the Haitian seeing... is the Haitian Revolution in your book too in the embroidered book a little bit uh, a little it's it's mentioned but not it's it's not a, a big factor but the Haitian Revolution is um, a bigger part of a book called um, a Declaration of the Rights of Magicians which came out recently as well um, so yeah it's, that's the Haitian Revolution is so fascinating and um, but it, it doesn't factor into the embroidered book very much which is mostly centered in Europe. So we're going to talk about the embroidered book, and we have two excerpts. I just wanted to uh, mention again, if you're watching this on YouTube or Twitter, or you're here and you don't know what's going on, this is the Second Life Book Club, and we do this every Wednesday, 12 o'clock. Sometimes we accommodate people in different uh, guests in different time zones. So make sure that you uh, check out the calendar on on YouTube. Kitten Duo is watching. Kitten Duo has been a Drax fan for two months. Thank you, Kitten, for your support. Awesome. Betty is on the chat. Isolte. Um, Isotope mentions here Democracy Now! And PBS is a good source to add. Absolutely. Been a Democracy Now! supporter for many, many years when we lived in the US and, and beyond. Um, now, and, and this is so funny, Kate, that you're speaking about the French Revolution because I'm mapping out my nonfiction reading list for 2022. And it's all about revolutions. I really want to get into this into this period, also the, the German Revolution, 1848, and then a little, yeah, French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, American Revolutionary War. So I'm going to get the embroidered book. The embroidered book is coming out uh, February, I believe, um, mm -hmm. from Harper Voyager. And uh, again, a quick um, quick elevator pitch, French Revolution. Yeah, so the embroidered book... No? 
Yeah, no time to travel in this one. It's historical Aww. fantasy. Uh, and it is about Marie Antoinette and her sister, Queen Charlotte of Naples, uh, as rival magicians. So it's it's sort of a secret history. All of the history is the same, but in behind the scenes, uh, we have magic happening. Mm. And it is, it's coming out in February from the UK, but the North American publication date is in May next year. I say uh -huh. next year, even though it's three days away. <laughs> three days? Oh, my yeah. God. Or less than that, yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, Kate, you can't even throw, you can't even purchase like fireworks for five hundred dollars anymore these days. It's really terrible. <laughs> Where has what has freedom come to? The counter revolution. This is really the freedom <laughs> issue. Okay, uh, people don't understand my uh, humor. Uh, they think I'm serious, so I better uh, be quiet. Now, the embroidered book stand has come out of the um, out of the uh, earth here, and we're going to have a little reading. Let me see here. Uh, you have to set it up for me because sure. I have. Oops. Uh, don't worry. We we'll get the uh, we we'll get the book stand in front of you. This is the magic book stand. Nice. It will move. It will move. I need this in my real life. I need the, <laughs> the magic book stand. I got a um, a digital copy, uh, but I encourage everyone to pre-order this as well. If you like it, pre-orders are very very important. Um, for authors, these numbers are important. They show the publisher that there's interest. So let's listen to a little excerpt. Please mm -hmm. set it up. What's sure. happening? So this is uh, from early on in the embroidered book. Uh, it's not it's not the first scene, but it's it's an early scene. And so what's happened is uh, Marie Antoinette, who's uh, called Antoine at this point in her life, that's what they called her in Vienna when she was a girl, um, and her sister Charlotte. And uh, they actually have a spell book, which has an embroidered cover, which is the embroidered book in question, uh, that they belonged to their governess, and their governess then died mysteriously. And so they inherited this book that nobody knows about. Uh, and so they're trying to work a magic spell. Their mother, Maria Teresa, who's the, uh, the empress, um, is going to marry their sister Josepha to a terribly terrible man, um, the king of Naples, and they're trying to stop this. They want to change their mother's uh, opinions change her heart in some way uh, so that's they're about to do this magic spell to uh, to change a pair of gloves that will help Charlotte persuade their mother to do the right thing and just in case people don't know who Marie Antoinette was the last queen of France executed mm -hmm. uh, at the height of the uh, revolutionary um, trials yep. by guillotine that's correct mm. and so she she began life as an archduchess in Vienna um, and was one of the many Habsburg children that were sent all over Europe to various marriages uh, to consolidate the empire. So I'll read this section from the embroidered book. She opens the embroidered book. On the 30th page, there is the spell she needs in her long dead governess's patient and frilly handwriting. It's mostly writing this time, Charlotte murmurs. You have pen and paper? I brought the other things. The other things are a velvet coin purse filled with her own finger, fingernail clippings and a small copper coin with the shield of Austria on one side and one Heller 1765 on the other. She doesn't have a clipped groat and she hopes this will do. She goes now to Antoine's dressing table where her sister has laid a few scraps of paper, an inkwell and a quill. Charlotte has already decided on the hope for chocolate cake tomorrow, a passing fancy or appetite. The memory, small as it is, is harder than she thought it would be. The people who used to tell jokes were Papa and Charles, and they are both dead, and she doesn't want to sacrifice her memories of them. Finally, she remembers the way her little brother Max dramatically lifted his coattails to sit down at dinner the other day in imitation of a certain cousin. She smiles and writes that down. The loves are difficult. For the fondness, she writes the name of Mops, Antoine's little pug. It's hard to imagine not being fond of Mops, with his perpetually confused face and delightful little ears. The affection is a little trickier, but ultimately she settles on Lurchenfeld, her new governess. She's been a good governess, even something like a friend. Charlotte folds the paper so that Antoine won't see what she's written. They do this to spare each other. Into each point of the star she puts her sacrifices, walking around twice clockwise so she can place them in order as they are in the spell. 
Then Charlotte pulls the final item out of her pocket, the long white gloves with her monogram on them. Mama says it is a waste for the unmarried archduchesses to monogram anything. Soon they will have new initials once they're married. But Charlotte likes to mark the things that are hers. She steps gingerly over the ash lines of the star, places the gloves in the middle, and steps back. I give these things, she pronounces. She takes a deep breath, pulls out a handkerchief, and puts it to her nose. She can hear Antoine doing the same, but she smells nothing, sees nothing. Perhaps the sacrifices aren't worth enough. The coin is wrong, or the memory too trifling. Perhaps they misunderstood the spell altogether. They've never tried this one before. Then, small but real movement. The little pile of fingernail and toenail clippings darkens and shifts. The coin rusts and wears, going green and then bright orange and then brown. The bits of paper become ragged and thin, and as with every spell, there's a horrible moment when the words come off the paper in a stream of ink that rises into the air as if someone were tugging on them. Little currents of dark ink in the air, dissipating, gone. The paper itself is a pile of brown threads, and the pile of nail trimmings is now a kind of sludge. Everything goes brown, eventually. The coin, the paper, the nails. It's working. Charlotte watches it all with her usual, usual fascination. It distracts from the fact that she's losing things, including some she will not remember. No matter how small, these losses are deaths unnaturally hastened. They have given death more than its due. But now she is 15, and she has need of important magic. Thank you very much. Everything is better with magic. That's Kate Hartfield reading from the embroidered book, which will come out next year. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is a fantastic reading. You you can you may actually oh well if you like to sit down. Yeah, perfect. Sure. Um this is my little sort of headmaster role play in Second Life. I say it every week where I can boss people around, sit down, get up. <laughs> you know what I found? I don't know. Is, is, is that a different Kate Hallford? Because I was looking around on my German ebook um, retailer and I found a book also coming out next year um, Assassin's Creed. Creed yes. The, the Magus Conspiracy, an Assassin's Creed novel. Yeah. How about that? Yeah, so that's what I'm writing right now, and it's it's already been announced, and it's um, it's available for pre-order. I'm writing a, a novel set in the Assassin's Creed universe, which is uh, fantastic. It's lots of fun. Um, Assassin's Creed is very big in my household, and uh, so uh, we all play it, and um, I couldn't be more thrilled. Oh, this so is cool. It, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, just that it, it's similar in some ways to my other work, and that it's it's sort of set in the uh, little bits and pieces in between real history, and it's mostly in the, the 19th century. What I, as a young reader, I loved novelizations of movies. I mean, I loved E.T., the movie, but I honestly got to tell you, William Kotzwinkel, E.T.'s uh, novel, the novelization of the movie, I think I like that better. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know, from your perspective, from a uh, from a writer i mean it, like you said this 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 is exciting but the appeal of of books that are set in in games or movies what mm -hmm. some people don't understand that like why would i read a book if i can play the game or if i can watch the movie basically again it's more um i guess the people who express that they go like okay i have a visual medium that is really really yummy yeah. And if I read a book that reduces it, I don't understand that sentiment, but but have you heard that uh, expressed? Yeah, yeah, it's interesting from a writer's perspective because I am trying to capture what makes the Assassin's Creed games really cool, but also recognize that I want to play to the strengths of a book uh, and that the strengths of a game are slightly different. You know, uh, when you do the leap of faith uh, for anyone who plays Assassin's Creed, that's really fun to do in a game. Uh, in a book, um, that might not be as fun. Maybe, maybe it would be, but what's more fun in a book is that you get more of a chance to delve into uh, the characterization and the, the lore and the world building and all the rest of it. Um, so somehow bringing all those things together, uh, but playing to the strengths of the medium is an interesting tension, I think. Alfonso Loon here says in the local chat, why not? If I really like something, I want to absorb it on every medium, get bathed on, in the lore, and that's... Uh, 
what the IP, oh, uh, the owners of the IP undoubtedly think that their market research shows that if you're a super fan, you're going to absorb absolutely everything, um, including the uh, the blanket uh, with um, the Assassin's Creed uh, logo on it, wearing a T-shirt, reading the book, <laughs> reading Kate's <laughs> book while the while the game is playing in the background, and you have your headphones on with the soundtrack. No, no, yeah. absolutely. But I I do find it interesting to explore some sometimes a little bit of attention from from um a writer and then some writers are uh, have expressed a little you know um apprehension to engage with with games i see a little little bit of tension there maybe you know like they're encroaching on my territory you know these mm -hmm. games and if i engage in uh furthering the, the, the games as a medium then i i'm I'm hastening my own death as a, a writer of of books because nobody reads anymore. I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's uh, I I think there's a lot of crossover. You know, I mean, I play games and I read. Um, so uh, yeah, I think I'm hoping that there are people like Alphonse who will say, "Well, I really love to do both." Do you see that in your um, in your craft sometimes when when it's expressed outright like that where mm -hmm. writers say well people should read more the reason why people don't read is because video games yeah i i do see that but i think you know I, i'm not sure that it's true it probably depends on the person you know i have a, a kid who's almost 12 and uh, he does both he plays video games and he reads a lot and i can see the how they feed into each other a lot of his interests uh, came to him from video games, and then he follows it up by reading history books and that kind of thing. Um, I mean, that's so a different question. If, if yeah. uh, sorry to jump in here, if, mm -hmm. if 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 that is actually the case, I mean, that's a different mm -hmm. question. But my question is specifically, if writers are concerned about this, uh, you know, in in the music business, people, you know, musicians often complain about nobody listens to albums anymore because um, everybody is at home or they don't know how to appreciate a good recorded album because everybody has like some bad uh, digital audio workstation on their laptop and they just put together these blocks and stuff like this. It's sort of a, a media critique, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, I, I like writing in all kinds of different media. So um, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see what happens with books over the, the next several decades. But uh, you know, so far they seem to be going strong and I'm happy to write different kinds of things. I have one um, quote from you that Chyla uh, unearthed. Here's a bunch of uh, quote, um, comments in the chat first here. Jessica says, I live in an Assassin's Creed household, so I tweet tales from the women's quarters. Jessica says one day he will have a horrible accident with that sword. Um, I hope Jessica is not... Um, telling us in sort of veiled words that she's trying to murder her uh, husband with a sword. So when you read that in the news tomorrow, <laughs> you heard it here first. Um, Kate, this is, a, this is a quote from you about the pandemic. You say, my creative brain is my coping mechanism, so I'm enjoying dreaming and plotting out my current novel. But when it comes time to sit down and write, I frequently struggle these days with kind of brain freeze, can't execute and get the words down effect of long-term low-level stress um, and I'm sure a lot of us are feeling the same way. Also I lost a lot of the options I used to have to get into a fresh headspace by going to work at the library or my favorite coffee shop which sounds trivial but was a bigger part of my working life than I realized. So these these are good points. Do you have any workarounds? I mean immediately when you say that I can relate to your so these favorite different spaces what I do is I just go for more frequent walks for example and that kind of and then i go back into my little space so that kind mm -hmm. of works um but yeah yeah Is yeah definitely it's, yeah no it's it's been hard i think in different ways for everybody um i do miss coffee shop writing a lot and i miss getting together with friends to write um i do do online versions of that so you know I'll, I'll write with friends and we'll cheer each other on uh through slack or zoom or whatever it is um which helps a bit but uh it's still you know you can still hear your family members in the next room and you just don't get that sense of being separated from your life so that you can just concentrate on writing uh hmm. but you know we adapt uh so it is i think part of it is just being patient with yourself and recognizing that things the conditions are not optimal <laughs> so not not beating yourself up when uh 
uh, when it doesn't go as well. Oh, and I see the comment. We have group writing here in SL, so that's that's great. Absolutely, yeah, Angel was saying. I mean, like when mm -hmm. this comes up and and uh, in Second Life, we. I mean, I'm not going to say like we 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 don't see this as a problem, but it was funny. The beginning of the pandemic, I talked to every Second Life person, every Second Life resident friend. They say, you know, what's different? And they say, well, not nothing much. I work and I play in this world um, that I make and I have my community and I have a sense of presence. I, I, I have my embodiment, uh, but especially the sense of belonging, the sense of being there and the sense of going to a actual place and then being there. Uh, writers also, use, I mean, I used to look out the window as my avatar towards the, the ocean and and have that you know you can call it a screensaver or whatever but i was there i went to my place in second life sat down at the typewriter and then i started working and then i got up in second life walked out the door set in front of the ocean and it 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 felt like that it it it, it transports you so anyways yeah this is not a second life commercial uh, infomercial <laughs> um, but it's interesting because there's a big discussion on Twitter about conventions and inclusion of for people with um, various disabilities, and I just find it completely baffling that um, options that are available are not really utilized. There's been Second Life conventions as far back as 18 years now that were mixed reality with people in, at the physical lo uh, location, but also people in Second Life, and we've done the uh, conventions during the pandemic. I don't know. the 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 museum convention had four thousand people. The Adult Swim summer party was ten thousand or something. I mean, anyways, I'm getting off track here. I, I apologize, Kate. No, no, it's it's good. And you know, thank goodness that we have these options. You know, because it makes a huge difference. I think it's not. You know, we'd like to have the option of doing everything for sure, but uh, it's really been um, a real. It's really helped to take the edge off the worst of it. I think having an online community for sure. Danger Dave is saying, I have writer friends from all over the world that I've known for years and they've never met in person. Same here, mm -hmm. um, colleagues. Uh, we're going um, to wrap at the bottom of the hour. We're wrapping already in the post game into the main uh, live stream to keep people um, on the stream to, to, to get them the, the, the full program. So, uh, but we're going to wrap tight as usual. We have one more reading, one more excerpt from the embroidered book. And now I, I I have to ask Kate to stand up again. Yes, absolutely. Have okay, the so... magic book stand reappear. My God, do we yes. still have the magic book Walk stand? Into the furniture here. There we go. Where is the magic book stand? The magic book stand. Hello? The magic book stand. I'm making it hard on the magic book stand. There we go. The magic book stand is speaking to me, and the magic book stand didn't know if if it was um, the embroidered book or Alice Payne arrives. No, it's the embroidered book magic book stand. The embroidered book uh, coming out next year from um, Harper Voyager in the yes. UK and in the in the United States of America. That's and how true, about the yeah. rest of how about the rest of the world? Yeah, we, well, I have a Canadian publishing date, which is the same, May 24th, as the um, as the U.S., and I know about Australia and New Zealand, and I don't know about the rest of the world, um, except I think you can get get them from Harper Voyager in English, and I'm hoping for some translations, but I haven't had any, uh, any news on that yet. Here is so, the book. Yeah, I think we're, is the book stand ready? Are we good to go? I think we are. The book stand is ready. The book stand told me uh, the book stand is ready. Okay. He, so uh, they, sorry. This is a um, an excerpt from later on in the embroidered book um, after Marie Antoinette has moved to Versailles in France and she's married to the Dauphin who is the, the heir to the throne of France. Uh, and she's having a little bit of a difficult time there. Um, <laughs> for anyone who knows Marie Antoinette's story knows the, uh, the understatement. Uh, so I'll just read this next this next part. What Antoinette likes best about the exterior of the Chateau of Versailles is not the sensuous gray stonework or the red brick that glows like the cheeks of a freshly scrubbed schoolboy or even the golden fleur-de-lis that rise from the railings against the azure sky. No, what she likes best are the windows. Sometimes they are as dark as deep water, 
Sometimes, at a certain angle, they shine in jagged white, reminding Antoinette of the sugar on a slice of Gugelhopf, the cake Papa used to love, which I've probably just mispronounced. Gugelhopf, not very good. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, like now, the sun sh glazes them golden opaque, like the top of a linzer tort. It makes her smile. Out in the royal courtyard, little knots of people walk in the gentle sun of an early May morning. And her coach is waiting, its robin's egg panels painted with mythological scenes and four white horses ready to go visiting. On a day like today, she cannot believe that Prince Louis de Rohan or anyone else wishes her harm. He's gone to England anyway. Everything may not be for the best in the best of all possible worlds. Her marriage is unconsummated and Mama is always disappointed in her. But the sun shines on Versailles. Antoinette lifts one sage silk shoe to step into her coach when one of the four horses snorts and the other stamps. Another coach comes rattling past, passes by Antoinette's, and then rolls to a stop. It shines in black and gold, the horses roan and bay, their coats glossy. The footman opens the door, and out comes the Comtesse du Berry in a dark green polonaise with a berger straw hat tilted down over her face. When she turns her gaze on Antoinette, it looks wide-eyed and dazed, rather than, as is usual, studiously blank. The king is dying, she says. Antoinette steps back down to the grey stones of the courtyard. The king has been ill with smallpox for more than a week, but everyone said he was improving. Surely he has sent me away so he can confess all his sins without the little additional sin of me on his conscience. Oh, I know he did that with another mistress once, but this time I think he won't recover and I won't return. May God help him, Antoinette prays. But what will happen if the king dies now, today? The Dauphin, he's in his foundry. They'll send someone to tell him, now that I'm out of the way. Antoinette doesn't know what to say. His, his majesty's love for you. Ha, the countess interrupts, staring at something invisible just over Antoinette's shoulder. Ha, for Louis, loved, love only flowed one way, like taxes. He collected as much as he could from as many as he could, and he's still dying bankrupt. Madame de Berry looks at Antoinette then, just for a minute, and turns and gets back into her lacquered coach. The shoes that carry Antoinette elegantly over the floors of Versailles don't manage well on uneven ground. She skids across silvery stones, up the stairs to the marble courtyard, where the black and white diamonds unbalance her. It's crowded. She's trying to find Louis, her Louis. Nobody knows to know, seems to know where he is, or to quite care. She sees Madame de Noy and runs to her. Your Highness, the Dame d'Honneur says, and for once she doesn't flinch from Antoinette's embrace. Do you think it's really true? Madame de Noy nods and whispers. They say the king's face is as dark as bronze from the disease. I must find my husband. The Dauphin is in your rooms, waiting for you. Dear Louis, the last place she would have looked. The king's valet comes trotting out into the courtyard, his face red with rouge and activity. The Comtesse de Berry, he gasps. His Majesty calls for Madame de Berry. Gone, someone says. Her coach just left, Antoinette says. I saw it. She can't have got far. The valet shakes his head. There isn't time. I'll stop there. Thank you. And again, this is the embroidered book, Kate Hartfield. Thank you. I was just going to ask, do you have um, people who advise you with historical stuff so that you're sure you get it, you get it right if you have questions? Um, I, I sort of do. I have I'm mostly I rely on documentary evidence a lot. So I don't typically need to ask people uh, to look things over, although I will if there's something that I want to make sure that I am not stepping in something <laughs> that I don't realize. Um, so mostly it's just, you know, if I know a friend uh, who lives in a given country or something like that, I'll, I'll ask. Um, but for the most part, I've just um, I've taken a lot pretty closely from letters uh, and documents of the time um, which helps a lot to get things not too horribly bad this is an interesting quote from you that um, shyla pulled from a previous interview about historic sexuality but i think it applies to other aspects as well you said when i'm not sure how to represent a character i will actually just go to the actual evidence of the time and find what people said about them or what they said themselves and try to use those words as much as possible so that I'm representing them as truly as I can, while at the same time trying to not represent things in a way that uh, will be hurtful 
uh, to modern readers unnecessarily as well. So it is a balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I, I ran into that a it lot. It goes through a uh, filter. I mean, it goes through your filter and through the the cultural, what you perceive as the cultural norms of, of, of today, I guess, or that kind of balance. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I find that when I'm in doubt, that that always helps is to go back and say, okay, what did the person say about themselves? And how did they see themselves? You know, so for example, I have um, uh, the Chevalier Dayan is a character in this novel. Um, and uh, she asked to be considered a woman uh, in the entire second half of her life. Um, and uh, she identified as a woman, and so she's a woman in my book. Um, mm -hmm. And it, there's, I found that to be quite straightforward because that was her. That's how she referred to herself. So it's not as if I had to um, make a big, uh, have a, you know, it wasn't a difficult question to solve because I had her own words uh, to go with. Uh, whereas I think other writers have treated that historical character as more complicated than uh, than she considered herself. You know, so that. I think there are different approaches to it and, and it's always valid. But for me, I just always went back to, okay, well, what did this person say about themselves? Mm -hmm. um, or if I can't say for sure, then I, I kind of leave it. Uh, so, you know, so the big, one big question is um, why did Louis and Marie Antoinette not consummate their marriage for seven years? Mm -hmm. And uh, there are many, many theories about this. And um, I, you know, I definitely think that, um, there are lots of different people who could see themselves in Louis and, and his uh, reluctance. And, uh, you know, I don't really know what, what the reason was. It could have been physical. It could not have been physical, but in the end, my editor and I talked about it a lot. And in the end, we sort of um, left it somewhat unexplained. And uh, I think modern readers can sort of see the evidence that I can see and, and decide for themselves what they think was going on there. And, and they can also just decide to leave Louis his privacy about that to a certain extent, the poor man. Yeah, but it's but that's a great example because that's also uh, I mean by every medium I mean a, a movie is no different than a book. It could have uh, been seen as a very deliberate choice of yours, depending on how you construct the book, as something that that then happens in our minds where mm -hmm. we where we fill in those blanks. I mean that's the exciting part of I mean for me anyway as a reader I'm not you know I'm here just as a fan, uh, mm -hmm. being able to build parts of the world myself in my own head is is the most exciting part of it and filling in those blanks yeah absolutely and i you know and i think that there is um it is i think important for modern readers to see themselves represented in stories about the past and to see um how similar people are in many ways and that they've struggled with a lot of the same issues which doesn't necessarily mean that we need to use the same terminology to describe people's identities. Um, I think we can we can be pretty nuanced and still have that representation there. Well, in um, Oklahoma, um, as it stands, as of uh, before we started, you could now file a complaint as a parent, uh, one complaint, and then the book will be removed from the school library. We will see when that happens with your embroidered book. <laughs> Maybe you'll get some free publicity. I mean, I'm making a, a you know, I'm trying yeah. to uh, make light of this in a, in a jokey way, but it is utterly frightening uh, what's yep. happening, uh, especially with um, with this assault on, yeah, on literature and knowledge. And it's, you know, it's not a new thing. It's, it's uh, started with the Scopes Monkey trial in the 20s, at least in the US didn't even start there, started earlier whenever mm -hmm. it started, but it's always, it's an ongoing thing. Uh, we always gotta be vig vigilant about that. Yes, absolutely. I think it's, it, it is, it's ongoing and it's, it's terrifying, um, you know, and I think we do. The, democracy is, is a not, for cry. Yeah. yeah, democracy is, is really fragile. Dave says here in the local chat says, uh, in terms of, uh, I guess, uh, getting advice on stuff and verifying things. The best way to get an answer is not to ask a question, but to post a statement on the internet. That is pretty good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> get a lot of got a get a lot of answers. Um, Kate, this has been uh, a real pleasure. I hope you had a great time. I'm going to wrap it with the credits. Um, are you going to be okay for 2022? Um, more. I think uh, so. I think it's going to. Yeah, it's going to be a busy year. Um, the uh, things I have coming out next are um, a story in the anthology Trouble the Waters, 
Uh, I have a story, a medieval story in that, which comes out later this uh, in January. Um, and the embroidered book coming out February or May. And yeah, it's available for pre-order everywhere. It seems that despite uh, you, you acknowledging the, the um, issues that we all go through uh, with the pandemic um, impacting our creative lives and otherwise lives, uh, you seem to have a good, um, good grip on it, a good handle mm -hmm. on it. Um, and um, yeah, uh, I would like to thank you again, Kate. Uh, thanks also for this wonderful audience. Uh, really wonderful to see the last show of the year so fully attended with a lot of new faces today, including Captain Ray Auden, who plays a big part in uh, Alice in the Alice Payne books. I don't know how he got here, but uh, <laughs> he'll tell you in the sequel of, of Alice Payne. Why? Oh, why do you you taking a break from Alice Payne? I mean, you set up, like I said in the beginning, you, you're set for life. You could just keep writing Alice Payne. It's true. I know. Yeah, there's uh, I have. Uh... A vague idea for what would happen in the third book and uh yeah i could keep writing those books forever for sure um the publisher hasn't asked for any more uh right now oh. uh, so you know if we get a lot of sales <laughs> going with them that would probably be the best way to encourage the publisher to write some more but even so i might uh write and even self-publish some or have a different publisher ask to see if they'd be interested please at some point. please do that yeah. because i mean the the you you laid this out so brilliantly that that you have so many options where this could go i mean it's really it's like it's a perfect foundation for for something uh that could go on for a very long time I, it, it, it name escapes me from um uh i i will i i'll it, it'll come to me after the show but there's a um a scottish writer yes, who has absolutely. a series thanks, who thanks so much for doing this and thank you everybody behind the scenes for making this uh this happen in this wonderful set it's amazing and, and i want to thank the audience too it's been great oops did my voice just die no i'm still here oh here we go okay can you still hear us yes ah good uh okay i'll run through the credit slides thank you guys uh, wonderful um attendance wonderful show wonderful team book club every wednesday 12 o'clock pacific time which is the same as Second Lifetime. Sometimes we do a different time, depending on where the author is located in the physical realm. Please check the calendar. slbookclub at dragster.com is the uh, email for the program for critique, um, you know, hate mail. I read everything. Please do criticize me. Uh, tell me if I talk too much, not enough, or just the right amount. Show is produced by Isabel Sharen, Chala Supergecko, myself, location manager, Master Builder Ruby Geek. Avatars are made by Ruby. The research by Shyla the Super Gecko. We have lots and lots of sponsors, meaning they give us their Second Life wares and services for free in exchange for, uh, well, telling people about how awesome they are on this program and everywhere we go. You can also look around, and if you like something, you right click and you see who made it and you go there and you say the book club sent you and you saw it at the book club archipelago wonder wonderful sponsors linden lab one of the sponsors as well of course because they give us these islands for free we have three islands and i'm going to ask for one more because um well i'm just going to keep asking them and uh, if they don't give us then we're going to go to mark zuckerberg's metaverse and goodbye second life no we, we won't do that uh Find links to the calendar, Discord, Flickr on the sandwich board scattered around the islands. You can um, send Jared a message, Jared Bot, or email if you have authors that you want here on the show. Please don't forget to tip our volunteer staff. Very important. This is all volunteer work. And I know you guys have some loose linden shekels uh, in your in your pants there. Um, and they need to go into the tip jar right now. Nyusha says, Drax, you never talk too much. Thank you, Nyusha. Uh, <laughs> I will send you a, a private recording of me talking for 12 hours nonstop. Next week is already the new year. And the first guest of the new year is Daniel Krause. Now, Daniel Krause was here before with an, with an excellent book called The Living Dead, which he co-wrote, not at the same time, but he was... Um, given the job by the estate of George A. Romero to write a book based on George's notes and The Living Dead was an absolute um, sensation. Oops, this is actually the wrong Daniel Krause. 
This is from last year. So Daniel Krauss is back with a graphic novel called The Autumnal, and that's January 5th at 12 o'clock right here on the Second Life Book Club. Goodbye. <laughs>